The lyric is filled with meaning. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Yet I suspect that many, if honest, would say they're no longer blind, but they still can't see. At least not like they were hoping to. They're not disbelieving, but they're not fully believing. They don't really doubt, but they still don't fully believe. They just sort of believe. One man said as much to me, he said, I would never want to be seen as an unbeliever, but I just have difficulty fully believing. If someone doesn't not believe, is that believing? Is it possible to sort of believe? Are there different stages of faith? Are there different stages of sight? Are there different stages of spiritual restoration? One time Jesus sort of healed a blind man, and then he fully healed him. Today I want to use that story to name six stages of spiritual restoration. I wonder which stage you're in. Are you sort of? Fully? That's what I want to talk about today. I was over the Atlantic on my way to the Holy Land where Wendy and I were getting ready to lead a tour of some 30 people. We were high above the ocean and it was time to eat. I always enjoy mealtime when I'm flying, but the cramped space is difficult for me. I've had a tremor in my right hand most of my life and it's easier for me when I'm eating to lean into my fork than to bring the fork up to my mouth. Same with drinking out of a cup. But in the economy class that I fly, you don't get much lean over room so it's always a bit of a struggle. Not like a disability struggle, just like a nuisance struggle. I unwrapped all the stuff on the meal tray in front of me and I started to eat. I brought the fork to my mouth and it went right in no shaking. I could feel it deep that the tremor was gone. I figured maybe I just hadn't haven't had enough caffeine. Maybe it was the altitude or something weird like that. Or maybe just maybe it's because I'm going to the Holy Land, which I dismissed it pretty quickly as superstition, but something changed. I held out my hand to myself and it wasn't shaking. I enjoyed my meal without shaking the food off my fork. There was such an unusual feeling of calm in my hand. The tremor had just pretty much gone away. Not totally, but drastically. It was clearly different and I didn't know why. We landed in Israel and I kept checking it, occasionally just holding out my hand to see if I could keep it steady and marveling at it. Just holding my hand steady was like a newly developed skill. I showed Wendy, but I didn't tell anyone else. I, I guess I was afraid it was a fluke and that it would be short-lived, so I didn't want to get my hopes up or jinx it. And Wendy and I both sort of had the same sense of, this is amazing, this is weird, I hope it lasts. Several days in, I was talking to Rodney, my identical twin brother, who's had the same tremor for most of his life, identical. I told him about it and he asked when it happened. I explained that I noticed it in the air over the Atlantic. He asked what day and what time. I told him, and he said that at that same time, he was sitting in traffic here in Sarasota, praying for people around him. And as he stretched out his hand to pray, the tremor stopped. Our tremor stopped at the same time. He was praying for people in Sarasota. I was leading people to the Holy Land. And neither of us was praying for the tremor to be gone. It just happened. Now, in reality, it didn't really go away for either of us. It just got seriously better. Like, I used to not be able to hold my hand steady at all, and now I can. But if I'm trying to drink out of a cup, it still gives me a problem, especially if it's my second or third cup of caffeine, or if I'm trying to drink water with adrenaline coursing through my system. It's still a nuisance, it's just not nearly as much of a nuisance as it was. And so I still do what I can to mask it so people aren't distracted by it. God forbid you might think I'm nervous. And so I still live with a tremor, but not the tremor I used to live with. So that happened. It was several years ago, and I never really made a big deal about it, or even talked about it publicly, that I recall at least, because while it's a crazy coincidence with my twin brother and all, it's not a real healing. It's just a sort of healing. And I'm not sure why or what it all means. I just know that once I had a tremor, but I still shake. 
Every now and then I ask God to finish it, but he hasn't. And I'm thankful for what I have received because it sure is better than what I had. I wonder how many of us have had a sort of faith experience. Like something changed in us and we're certainly better than what we were, but we're not sure it's what others talk about as their coming to faith experience. Like we can tell that something clearly happened, but we can't quite explain what it was other than that symptoms changed. Perhaps you feel forgiven, but not delivered. Perhaps you feel peace more often, but not often enough. Perhaps you accept God's love for you, but you just don't have any love for others. Or maybe you're not even sure you believe everything about the Christian faith, even if you do believe enough to say that you believe. It's not a lie, but it's just not the whole truth. There's just something missing. You hear others talk about a transformation and you just got a makeover. And so you have no problem singing, I once was lost, but now I'm found. But if you're honest, you'd have to say, I once was blind, but I still can't see. You received a sort of healing. My heart today is very tender to those who feel sort of. And I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of Christians feel sort of but they feel like they're not allowed to admit it. Mark 8, 22 to 26, Jesus had just fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread, and the disciples collected seven baskets of leftovers from it. And before that, he had fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and had 12 baskets of leftovers. And before that, he had healed a deaf and mute man. And before that, he had cast a demon out of a girl without even seeing her. But as we come to chapter 8, verse 22, Jesus and his disciples are in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, having launched just north of Tiberias on the west shore and set sail for the other side. Verse 22, they came to Bethsaida. And some people recognized Jesus as a healer, so they brought a blind man and begged Jesus to heal him. He took the blind man by the hand and he led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? The man looked up and he said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. I see in this story a metaphor of six stages of faith. Now to be clear, it's not only a metaphor, it really happened, but it's helpful as a metaphor. And so I'm going to name six observations of how we progress from disbelief to belief, from was blind to now I see. See if you can identify your own progress in this. When does it stop describing you. Number one, a friend leads you to Jesus. In the American church, this is often meant being invited to church. Ten years ago, three out of four unchurched people said they would welcome an invitation to church. That means one in four would have said, please don't even ask. But today, it's reversed. Only 25% of unchurched believers welcome an invite. 75% say they don't want to be invited. I wonder why. Is it only because they don't want Jesus? It's probably something more than that. And it's not the same thing for all of them. But I think for those of us with friends that we'd like to bring to Jesus, we just need to get back to the simplicity of what these people did. It says, some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. They learned where Jesus was. They went and they got their blind friend. They told him that they wanted to lead him to Jesus to ask if Jesus could heal him. The man presumably consented, and so they took him by the hand and they walked him to where Jesus was. And then they begged Jesus to touch him. If you're in the faith, who did this for you? For me, it was a family system that did it, but it was also individuals who did it. Who led you by the hand to Jesus and prayed that he would touch you? And is there anyone you're doing that for now? When we talk about this, we're not talking about tricking someone to Jesus. We're talking about leading someone to Jesus. And it's not about leading the person to someone else who can lead them to Jesus. It's just leading them to Jesus. 
The problem with church invitation style evangelism is we come off sounding like we're withholding information. Like we're trying to get them into the back office where they're trapped with a professional closer who takes their driver's license and won't give it back until they've bought the car. It makes everything look like it has this hidden agenda. But what if instead we just said, hey, I believe Jesus can help. You mind if I lead you to him and ask him to? And then if they consent, we introduce them to the way of Jesus, praying that they make a connection, begging Jesus to touch them. This is almost always where coming to faith starts. Do you remember when you were the blind man being led to Jesus? That's the first stage of faith. It starts with that. A friend leads you to Jesus. Then number two, you follow Jesus. The story says that Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. Often we talk about following Jesus as something that comes after faith, but I believe we can come to faith by following Jesus. Was there a time that you started listening to the teachings of Jesus and following the way he taught? This might look like reading the Bible and discussing it with your friends who are also learning to follow Jesus. And it gives you new perspective that feels unfamiliar. Sort of like Jesus is taking you by the hand and leading you outside the village, away from your home beliefs. And he is, but as you follow him, your connection to him is growing and you begin to leave familiar convictions. I wonder, do you see yourself in this? This phase can go on for a while. How long does it take to get out of the village? And I guess it depends on how entrenched you are in the village. There's not a rule for it, but as you follow Jesus, he leads you away from the beliefs that have been home to you. And in a way, as long as you're holding on to Jesus, you feel no longer lost. You once were lost, but now you're found. Is that where you're at? First, a friend leads you to Jesus. Then Jesus leads you outside the village. Then the third stage is what most people mean when they talk about a faith decision. It's like suddenly someone turns on the lights. Number three, Jesus opens your eyes. And it's miraculous, even startling. Suddenly something makes sense. You have that aha moment and you suddenly believe. One minute you're in the dark, doing your best, comforted by the sounds and teachings of Jesus, and then suddenly he feels very close, almost nervously close. Your heart starts to race and then suddenly you feel a touch and light rushes in you can see. Now the story says that Jesus spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him and asked him, do you see anything? And the man looked around and he said, yeah, I see people. Faith is like that. Jesus feels very close. Your heart races and suddenly your eyes are opened. You can see. You were living in the dark, but not anymore. Someone asks, do you see? And you say, yeah, I can see. This is what many of us would call being saved or coming to faith or being born again. It's often at this point that we decide to be baptized. Our eyes have been opened and we've put our faith in Jesus. This is good. But I wonder how many of us have the guts to say what this man said next. He didn't just say, yeah, I see people. He said, yeah, I see people, but they don't look right. They don't look like people. He said, yeah, I see, but not completely. I only sort of see people. I suspect this is where many people stop progressing. They're afraid to admit that they were hoping it would be better. I think part of that is just human nature. We don't want to insult God, but I think we've also fearfully related to this as, as part of disbelief rather than part of confession. I think it's part of confession. Number one, your friends lead you to Jesus. Number two, you begin to follow Jesus. Number three, Jesus opens your eyes and asks if you can see and you say yes. But then number four, you confess that you still need more. Jesus asked, do you see anything? And the man looked around and said, yeah, I see people. But honestly, if I'm being totally honest, they look like trees walking around. He could see people, but they didn't look like people. If you've been to the eye doctor, you know the moment of truth where you have to say whether it looks good or not. And the pressure is always on to say it looks good, but sometimes it doesn't. This man was saying, it doesn't look good. 
I wonder how many of us have had a genuine experience with Jesus where our eyes were opened and light rushed in. The light of God hit us out of nowhere. We experienced a sense of remorse over our unworthiness and we accepted Jesus. We could see for the first time things we had never seen before. The reality of God, the glory of God, the total depravity of our own condition, the hope of the gospel. We put our faith in Jesus. We celebrated our new sight. We celebrated the light. We sang about how we once were blind, but now we see. But honestly, if we're being totally honest, we were hoping it would be better. We don't see with the clarity that we thought we would see. We can see our sin fine, but we can't see God's forgiveness, or at least not enough to really accept it. We see people, but they look like trees walking around. We see forgiveness, but it still sort of looks like God is disappointed in us. Or we can see our depravity, but we can't see the path to freedom from it. We see others walking around in freedom, but we're still stumbling around. Not really in the dark, just sort of in a cloudy haze and we're afraid to admit it, afraid to confess it, because it feels like a lack of gratitude or a lack of faith, or maybe a lack of effort, like we just need to try harder or maybe just blink our eyes more. Maybe, maybe it'll get better. The man admitted it. He dared to tell Jesus that he hadn't really healed him all the way. It's crazy. And notice what Jesus did. Well, first, notice what Jesus didn't do. He didn't shame him. He didn't blame him. He didn't snub him. He didn't move on to someone more worthy of sight. What did he do? He healed him again. But this time the man wouldn't be surprised by it because this time the man could see it coming. And this second time he would do what you need to do if you don't quite see clearly enough. Number five, you surrender in faith. The first time I'm sure the man was surprised by spit in his eye. I don't know if that was as weird to him as it would be in our culture, but the man didn't see it coming. He couldn't see it coming. He was blind. But this time, the man could see it coming. Not the spit, but the hands of Jesus. And even though he could finally see, he closed his eyes again so Jesus could touch them again. As the story reads, once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Listen, Jesus isn't mad at you for not seeing well. If you're doing what you can to open your eyes and see, and what you're seeing is cloudy and unfocused, Jesus isn't mad. He's inviting you to exercise faith by closing your eyes and surrendering to him. I've often wondered why Jesus didn't just go ahead and heal the guy completely the first time. Sometimes I've been a little embarrassed about this story, a little embarrassed for Jesus. But listen, it wasn't a lack of ability on Jesus' part, and it wasn't an inadequacy of faith on the man's part. I believe Jesus only sort of healed him the first time so that the man could then surrender his sight to the touch of Jesus as an expression of faith. To believe and to receive is such a grace. To be given the opportunity to exercise faith is such a grace. I suspect someone listening right now is sensing that you have enough faith to be fully restored. Perhaps God's inviting you to close your eyes and present your face to Him, to be touched by Him, to be healed by Him. Maybe the first time He just opened your eyes, He did it to you, for you, but this time He's asking you to close your eyes and present your face to him in faith, in tender surrender. Some people talk about this as being filled with the Holy Spirit. I do too, but I often call it my spiritual awakening. I experienced it many years after God first opened my eyes. I wanted to say I could see, and I could see, but I couldn't see what I wanted to see, freedom. But when I surrendered to God in my brokenness, and trusted him by closing my eyes and allowing him to touch me, the light rushed in at a whole new level. I could see. Literally, the colors were more vivid. The sky was more magnificent. And I'm not talking figuratively, literally. Not only did the people not look like trees, the trees themselves had life. Everything really, really looked different 
to me. The difference between seeing light and seeing clearly was so extreme, I felt like I had never before seen anything. But I had seen, I just hadn't seen clearly. I honestly can't tell you how Jesus wants to do that for you. I can only tell you that he wants you to see clearly. And I believe with all my heart that if you devote yourself to sitting in his presence and exposing your heart to him, closing your eyes and surrender, he will, through that process, open your eyes to brand new things. Please do that. Please do that. It's interesting how the story concludes. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. And that's actually where my faith lives, at home, where I examine my life with new eyes. And that's the gift Jesus gives you too. Number six, you see your life in a whole new light. Jesus sent the man home. He said not to go into the village, just go home. He had left home blind, knowing what things felt like, and he would return home seeing, knowing what things look like for the first time. When your eyes are opened, you will see your life differently. Many of the things that were pleasant to you will now be vulgar, and many of the things that were ugly to you will now have beauty. You will see people and things for whether they glow with honor or are smudged with sin. And there, as you see your home for what it is, even for the very first time, you will have opportunity to change it. So change it. Build a godly home with godly relationships, with godly habits. In fact, if I can say it this way, don't just come to Jesus. Go home. Don't just see. Look. This is a grace. And this is where transformation starts. Go home. So did you notice yourself in this story? Is a friend leading you to Jesus, praying that he'll open your eyes? Or are you beginning to follow the teachings of Jesus? Or have your eyes been suddenly opened? Or does it seem like there's still a lack of clarity? Or have you surrendered in faith to the Holy Spirit's touch? Are you seeing life differently, living in your home with greater clarity? If you've never been led to Jesus in the first place, find a group of friends who can introduce you to him. Find a Bible and start reading the Gospel of Matthew, then Mark, then Luke, then John, then Acts, and just keep going. Get to know Jesus, not just by studying about him, but learning to follow his teachings. Become a follower of the way of Jesus. He will meet with you and open your eyes. But don't just stop there. Be honest with him about what's still missing. Spend time with him, allowing him to get close. Ask him to heal you, to fill you with his Holy Spirit, and surrender to him. Do that, and you will see more clearly. And when you've done that, go home and be one who sees there. I don't know if my tremor will ever be more than sort of healed, and that's okay. But I do know this, I once was blind, but now I see, and you can too. I pray that it's so, may it be done according to your faith, amen.